Good. All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the House, Alaska House Majority Coalition Press Availability. We will have these weekly every Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. Uh, throughout our 90-day session. And yes, we do plan on only having a 90-day session this year. Uh, I hope nobody got uh, too shaken up or rattled with the earthquake that we had outside of Kodiak. Uh, I know there's tsunami warnings happening here in Juneau uh, in the middle of the night. Uh, but uh, looking at uh, this uh, potential natural disaster, if it would have happened uh, 300 miles inland, uh, it could have been a huge disaster for Alaska. And uh, one of the things I want to point out is we, are, we have been living paycheck to paycheck over the last few years. A uh, natural disaster like that can really put us into um, a fiscal endangerment. So uh, another reason why we need to have a fiscal plan for the state of Alaska so we can be able to handle uh, natural emergencies such as this. Um, I also want to say that uh, it's good news that the King Cove Road Agreement has uh, been passed and ratified. Uh, this is something that Speaker edgman has been working on for quite a while. I can remember my freshman term in 2009, 2010 sitting on resources and uh, going over this to where we were given masses, <laughs> massive amount of Alaska state land over to the federal government and trade just so we can have that road especially when you look at those communities and provide emergency services uh, for those communities. And uh, so finally, after eight years, it passed um, and got ratified. But I just want to say that back then, uh, we passed that piece of legislation 60 to 1. That was because of Speaker Edgman's uh, uh, leadership on that. Uh, uh, joining us today, we have Representative uh, uh, Les Guerra from Anchorage, serving District 20. He is our Vice Chair on Finance. And next to him, Representative Garen Tarr. Uh, also from Anchorage, serving in um, District 19, our uh, co-chair of resources. And then uh, Representative Matt Clayman uh, from District, 19, uh, sorry, District uh, 21, uh, who is our uh, chair of the Judiciary Committee. Um, our coalition is uh, committed to pass a funded uh, budget on time, uh, one that meets Alaska needs while avoiding the inefficiency and expense of uh, running delays and passing out pink slips to employees. And speaking of that, we do intend on having uh, Paul Seaton's bill over to the Senate very soon. That's a separate appropriations for public education at the base student allocation level so that uh, school districts can count on the state um, uh, having service, uh, having uh, uh, revenues for them and uh, a budget for them so they don't have to go through the expensive process of trying to figure out what we're going to do along the way. So we'll get that uh, off the table fast. We also want to introduce and pass legislation to create jobs, provide quality education for our kids, and efficient, efficiently deliver essential state services. We also want to bring back the stability and certainty back to Alaska's economy to spur investment and end this recession. And with that, I will turn it over to Representative uh, Les Guerra. Uh, thank you, Representative Tuck. You know, I had a conversation yesterday um, uh, where I got an approximate number. If the oil tax reform legislation this coalition passed last year um, were not blocked by the Senate, the revenue portion of it, um, at $67 an hour, a barrel, which is the price of oil roughly today, this state would raise an extra $800 million. That would be a good chip in towards the, the budget gap. And that really is sort of a launching point for uh, what I'd like to say. The, the members of this building need to get out of their political trenches. We do, everybody else does. You cannot do a fiscal plan by picking on one source of revenue only. Um, certainly, we feel that Alaskans are entitled to a fair share for their oil. Uh, $800 million a year, $400 million a year, that's a good chip in towards the budget deficit. But telling oil companies that they can pay a fraction of the oil taxes that the lower 48 states charge um, and uh, that they have to chip in everything else with a permanent fund, that's not a fiscal plan. We heard yesterday from the permanent fund that if you rely solely on the permanent fund, you raise the risk that you're going to jeopardize both the fund and the dividend as well. There is just not enough money in there to sort of tap and think you can think you can run government just on that. Um, there is a, a philosophical divide we hope we can get past. You know, I've heard many times from some of my more, more conservative colleagues in the Senate that taxes on the 600 6,000 corporations that pay no corporate tax, taxes on oil companies, that's taxes on job creators. You know, my wife is a physical therapist. 
she's a job creator. She helps that hospital go and run that she works at. Nurses are job creators. Teachers are job creators and opportunity creators. The idea that you just have to protect people at the upper end of the income scale, the most privileged, the wealthiest, the biggest corporations, and put the whole fiscal plan on the backs of everybody else, A, it doesn't work mathematically, and B, we should do better than just playing class warfare in this building. Um, everybody needs to chip in, but fairly. Um, thank you. And Representative Tarr. <clears throat> thank you. Good morning, Representative Garen Tarr from Anchorage. And just we'll build on Representative Guerra's comments. Uh, we did introduce House Bill 288 yesterday in the House Resources Committee. We characterize it as a conversation starter and wanted to, again, remind folks where we started last year as a coalition that came together for a fair and balanced fiscal plan, um, something that was sustainable for the long term. And that's what brings this to the conversation this year. Um, we've been unsuccessful in advancing new revenue measures, and the leadership from the other body has publicly said that that those things are off the table. So that limits our opportunities to what our existing taxes are. And, and that's what has directed us to, to go back and at least look at this one piece of our existing tax structure, and that's the minimum tax. Um, you know, yesterday in the presentation, and, and I'm happy to make this available, you know, had a chart to compare Senate Bill 21, you know, and House Bill 288. The fundamentals of the tax structure remain the same. The base tax rate, the per barrel credit, the GVR, all of those um, things that I would consider, you know, sort of the fundamental um, parts of that tax structure. So, um, so we're not looking at that this year. We don't want to um, have this become a, a big oil tax se session that um, we saw last year where um, those conversations went into July, but we think it's reasonable to um, address just this one piece of it and look at the minimum tax as part of the conversation about how do we address our $2.5 billion deficit. And what we showed yesterday, we're getting about $2 per barrel in severance tax. We're getting about 50 per barrel in royalty. Um, but, you know, when you add the two together, we'd need about 47 million more barrels of oil to fill the deficit, right? So it's just clear that that is not enough on its own, um, but you know we have to look at um, whether $2 um, is the right amount and, um, and have that conversation. And, and so I hope um, folks will consider that. I felt like the hearing was positive and um, we'll continue having those conversations and, and you know, I hope it spurs the conversation about um, how we, we do um, come up with something that's fair and balanced. I know it'd be difficult for me um, representing the poorest district in Anchorage um, to just ask you know the children and the seniors in my area um, to contribute more than um, what I think is is a fair request of some of the other industries or um, through a broad-based measure and again as as um, folks have set up here you know you have to operate in the realities of what's possible here in this building and if we have our Senate colleagues saying hey you know, this is off the table, that's off the table, this is off the table, um, then that, that puts all the pressure on, on what remains, and, and that's uh, House Bill 288. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Tarr. Representative Kamen. Thanks, Chris. It's good to be here this morning. There's just a couple of things I want to touch base on. First is that there's certainly been a lot, an increased awareness because of recent events about sexual harassment here in the Capitol, and I'm, I'm pleased I've been appointed on the Legislative Council subcommittee that's working on an updated um, workplace harassment policy and procedure here in the legislature, and that committee is moving forward. I expect we'll be meeting later this week, and that committee is making real progress in terms of a better policy and procedure for Alaska. Uh, some of the steps that have already taken place, which have been very positive, we've already had mandatory workplace harassment training for all legislators, and I think all but one legislator have participated and attended that. That was a uh, different sessions last week, and I think it had active participation from all the legislators that attended, and so that's been very positive. Uh, I should make it really clear that we really want to, we, we have zero tolerance for workplace harassment here in the legislature, and that the efforts to both improve our policy and to have mandatory training have been very positive, and, and we're moving forward on that after a lot of the news of recent events. And I think we've learned a lot from the Me Too campaign that's been going on on a national level and an increased awareness of, of workplace safety and workplace issues. The second thing I want to touch base about, we'll be having hearings this afternoon in the, in the House uh, Health and Human Services Committee. House Bill 25 is a bill that I introduced last year 
uh, the, the title involves insurance coverage for contraceptives, and people often refer to it as the bill that would, would mandate insurance companies to provide 12 months to, to provide coverage for 12 month birth control prescriptions. And this started out as just a good policy and, and a, a good health care bill and good policy. And then it's in the year since we heard the bill last session, I've been hearing more and more from people in the community about what, what the bill also involves, which is contraceptive coercion. And that's another thing I think that's become an outgrowth of the Me Too campaign is an increased awareness of, of violent environments and coercive environments. And it turns out we, I'm hearing more from more from folks that people that are perpetrating domestic violence are often using access to birth control as a way to try to, to facilitate that very uh, coercive and violent environments. And so we've actually been hearing from folks and, and today at the Health and Human Services Committee, we'll both be hearing from people who have been victims of domestic violence surrounding the issue of birth control prescriptions and also advocates that have helped those very folks. So this is a real, for me, a kind of a change in looking at legislation that I introduced about another feature of it that, that really highlights how important this particular legislation is about a safer Alaska and continuing our efforts as a state to eliminate domestic violence. So those are a couple of things going on here in the Capitol this week and glad to be here and happy to answer questions. And uh, Representative uh, Harry, you have some documents that we're going to be passing out. Oh, in the back, just for uh, folks who um, didn't cover the Capitol in the Capitol last year, uh, some of the folks who did uh, have already seen some of these documents. Um, there are some of the some handouts in the back from the Division of Legislative Finance, um, in the Governor's Office. Uh, Alaska is currently at the lowest level of spending, uh, among the lowest levels of spending, and about the level of 1975 adjusted for inflation on a per capita basis. Um, there, it, you'll see that, of course, we've cut about $3.5 billion from the budget since FY15. Um, uh, the evidence that we've heard in every single committee is if your plan is cuts only, um, every $100 million it cuts costs you probably about 1,000 jobs in a recession. Uh, so it's a great soundbite, but uh, when your schools are getting less money than they were five years ago, when you don't have enough prosecutors, and when you've cut $3.5 billion already, uh, uh, at some point you can't just be rain man walking around the building say, how about cutting the budget, how about cutting the budget? We've cut it $3.5 billion, and uh, you've seen the effects um, uh, in public safety, in schools, uh, in, in, in almost every aspect of society. But those documents in the back are available for you. All right, thank you. And with that, we'll open up to questions. Please state your name and affiliation. Good morning, Matt Hers with the Anchorage Daily News, which I have trouble remembering sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, <clears throat> it sounds like uh, from most accounts, uh, there's been trouble for the governor in finding a satisfactory replacement for Representative Westlake. Um, you guys are all Democrats, as far as I can recall. Um, we are. Do, do you guys think um, that the party has invested enough time, energy, money um, in rural Alaska to build the party to a place where it has viable candidates in that part of the state, or is this a reflection that um, the party maybe does need to invest more of those things um, in those places? Well, I just first want to point out that the governor has till January 24th, that's the 30th, uh, that's the 30 day deadline. Um, there is a continued search going on in the area right now, but I know the governor's office is doing due diligence and we want to make sure that we have the best person for District 40 and coming forward. Yeah, Matt, um, the, I don't know what the Republican Party is like. The Democratic Party is not loaded with money. Uh, we re la largely rely on volunteers. The volunteers in District 40, I think, are doing a great job. Mm -hmm. uh, they have other jobs. They have lives, and they're doing their best job. Uh, the governor is doing his best job to do due diligence, to look at the candidates that have been put forward, mm -hmm. and when he forwards them to us, we'll take a look. But I think the governor is doing his best job. These are volunteers in District 40, just like they would be in any other district. We don't have professional party members uh, uh, sort of running the show. We just don't have that kind of money. Also yes. the holiday. Also the holidays. James Brooks, Juno Empire. Wanted to ask uh, particularly Representative Clayman about Senate Bill 63, but the rest of you as well. That uh, the anti-smoking bill failed because of, I believe, one legislator. What are your views on that bill? How likely is it to pass? So you mean the smoke-free workplace bill? And 
that bill we heard in, in the Judiciary Committee yesterday, I'm gonna hear it, we'll be hearing it again on Wednesday. I expect it to move on a committee. My, my general sense, for, I mean, I haven't done a straw poll, but my general sense from committee comments is that the votes will be there to move it out of the Judiciary Committee and, and that we're the last committee of referral, so that the next stop would be uh, going to the House floor. Well, right, House Rules, there's, I don't expect a House Rules Committee meeting, but the House Rules would be where it decided whether to put it on the floor. Do you expect it to go to the floor? The I, my general sense is that Representative Ledoux is not, uh, not very motivated to put it on the floor. Hi, Shauna Crandall, Alaska Education Update. Can you guys comment on uh, the education budget and any education legislation that you see being acted on? What's um, Chris, I think you've answered that question already. Well, yeah, we, we do. Uh, we have Representative <laughs> Seaton's bill that's going to uh, put the base student allocation, <clears throat> to the base formula, um, and a separate appropriation bill to send over to the Senate for consideration. So we want to get that off the table so we're not pink slipping uh, teachers. And I just want to say something about our teachers real quick. You know, they uh, have master's degrees. They are um, committed to... Um, providing opportunities for our future generations. And I do think it's unfair that uh, they have to go through this process of uh, knowing whether or not they have a job year after year. Mm -hmm. And uh, we want to eliminate that. We want to have our best remain here, um, serving our students and not leave the state of Alaska because of this process that happens year after year of not knowing whether or not, whether or not they have a job. And so oftentimes we rely on teachers' passion to want to teach more than what we're willing to compensate them. And then we uh, uh, impose all these testing requirements and everything on them, uh, making it sometimes not such a rewarding job because uh, uh, we put them in tough working conditions. And so I think that this is a, a way that we can honor uh, the work that they do for our children. And uh, I think it's, uh, it should pass very quickly. And I just want to add to that, you'll notice that our entire caucus signed on to that, and you know, as a demonstration of, of that commitment. And Representative Tuck earlier mentioned about, you know, efficiencies in government. I was working with some educators over the fall, and they were talking about having to draft multiple budgets, multiple schedules, you know, have to go through several different scenarios of, you know, what funding amount um, might come, come out. And that's distracting from them being in the classroom and really putting their skills you know, into improving student outcomes. Um, so it's just, it's also just really inefficient and wasteful um, to delay these decisions and, and put them, you know, having to, to make those um, many, many different budgets and schedules and, and extra work. The, um, the other aim of that bill is to help us um, pass a budget uh, early, as you recall last year, until the la very last day, um, uh, um, our colleagues on the other side of the aisle uh, were pushing for about $70 million of education cuts. Uh, and it was not till the last day that um, they finally relented and we, uh, that $70 million cut did not pass. Uh, that's been the case for the last two or three years, uh, demands for 70, uh, $60, 70000000 million of education cuts. We're hoping that everybody can come together and not use that as something that extends the session into May, June, July, October. And are you hearing from your uh, colleagues in the Are you hearing from your colleagues in the Senate about support on the Senate side for that yet? Or is yeah, I believe that uh, Senator Stevens has a bill right. on that side as well. Mm -hmm. So this looks like something we can all get together behind. Mm -hmm. We've heard positive comments from folks across the aisle. Yes, Rich Mauer, Channel Two in Anchorage. Uh, House Bill 199, the Fisheries Habitat Protection Bill, um, how similar or different is that from yes, from the initiative, yes for salmon, and also uh, it looks like it was in introduced last year in March and it hasn't really moved. What's going on with that? Yeah, go ahead. I can answer that because I'm on the Fisheries Committee. So there's actually a hearing today on the newest um, draft version of the bill. And I'll, I'll admit I need to study further what those new um, changes are. Um, but I think Representative Stutes has been um, working, you know, with all the stakeholders um, in the interim. We did have one hearing at the end of last session. And then she held a town hall in Kodiak over the summer that some of us attended. I was there. Um, it was a topic of conversation there. So there's a lot of interest in that topic and, um, you know, pr protection for salmon streams and, and making sure that that's a, 
you know, a renewable resource. It's our culture. It's our way of life. Um, people depend on it for their, for their um, food source um, in many of our communities. So um, I think she's been working really hard with the stakeholders to try and um, craft language that can get some agreement. And if you have the time, you know, at 10 o'clock today is the, the hearing where we're going to discuss the new um, sub committee substitute. I, I apologize because I haven't had time. Um, in fact, we could talk with my staff afterwards because he was um, reviewing it. I have not had time to fully review the newest draft, and perhaps somebody else has um, more information on that. Additional questions? Yeah. <clears throat> um, Nat Hers again with the Anchorage Daily News. For Representative Clayman, I had to, I wanted to respond to this comment of yours. I'm curious, like you said, the legislature, or at least the House, has a zero tolerance policy for sexual harassment or harassment. I don't remember what your exact wording was, but like, what does that mean? Because you guys, I mean, you can't, there, there ultimately is like, you don't have the power to, like, I don't know what power you guys have. We have not really seen that exercise, so. Well, it, it, actually, this majority is the first majority in the history of the, of the state of Alaska to ask a member of its own caucus to resign over allegations of sexual harassment. So the notion about, are we doing anything? We actually did something that was historic. Uh, I can't find a single legislature that, legislator that is, thinks that even one case of sexual harassment is acceptable. I mean, this needs to be a place where people come to work and they don't need to be concerned about that occurring. And, and I think there's certainly been reports of a history from time to time of sexual harassment here in the Capitol. It's unacceptable. I mean, that's, that's different from a, that seems different from a policy, though, where, I mean, that's, is it fair to say that there actually, right now, is not a formal a, a good formal policy, and that's what you guys are working on? I, I think there is, a, there is a policy. I think it's a good policy. The policy that we've had in place has been in place for, for several years, and, and I think what we recognized in light of the more recent events, and I think it's more than just the, the issues involving Representative Westlake. It goes, goes to the whole Me Too campaign and increased awareness. I mean, you can't, you can't pick up a paper and not hear about another event going on around folks in the media industry, television, movies. It's also hard to pick up a paper without hearing about allegations involving our president. And so when you have an atmosphere where those concerns are going on, you have to say, is our policy good enough? Can we do better? And I think that's what I hear from Alaskans is, okay, we've got a policy, but can it be better? And I think that's the approach that, that we're taking on the subcommittee. We, we, took, we looked carefully at the policy that we have. We looked at several other states, and we concluded in looking at those. And I think there was real consensus on the subcommittee th that we can do better. And we, we looked, compared our policy to Oregon's policy and said, well, let's try to make revisions that are modeled on the Oregon policy. Again, that's not saying that we don't have a sound policy. That, that we, when we went through sexual harassment training, it was really apparent that we have a very sound policy. But that doesn't mean we can do better. I mean, you and I are, have a certain passion for trying to do distant sports as fast as we can, and we keep training because we think we might get better one day. You're young enough to probably improve your time. I'm probably too old to see any improvements, but we all want to try to do better. And to follow up on Nat's question, you talked about training and getting ready. Do you think there'll be any instances for this session where you'll have to put that into effect? I, I'm very optimistic that we will not. I, one case is, is, too, is one case too many. I, I actually w was one of the surprises for me when I first became a part of the legislature that, that we didn't have sexual harassment training as part of the kind of annual process of being here. And because every job I've had for the last, it seems like 25 or 30 years, it's a kind of a regular rite of passage that you go to harassment training. And so I was surprised we didn't have any. I think it's a really positive step to have that training and, and to have such broad participation. Any additional questions? All right, well, thanks for joining us again in the second week of uh, of the uh, second half of the 30th Alaska Legislature. Um, we are committed to uh, finding solutions this session and moving Alaska forward. Thank you very much.